I've been asked uh, uh, during the break uh, between, um, um, for the difference between, let's say, machine learning and neural networks, etc. So uh, let, me, uh, let me recap this. Uh, I think it's, a, it's an interesting question, so uh, can be useful for everyone. So l let's say that there is this big uh, set uh, that, that is the blackboard that actually, let's call it artificial intelligence. So the blackboard is artificial intelligence, and we don't care about everything that is outside this circle. This circle is machine learning, okay. actually. And uh, this circle is divided uh, typically in three categories. Okay. The, the three that I uh, told you at the very beginning. So one is supervised learning. Uh, one is uh, unsupervised learning. And another one is reinforcement learning. Okay. And uh, uh, I've talked about supervised learning uh, in the first hour. Uh, there are various examples of supervised learning. Uh, so the easiest one, let's say, are linear regression, for example, or regression more in general, logistic regression, for example. Uh, another uh, very common uh, type of supervised learning algorithm is called the support vector machine, SBM. Not going to enter into details of that. Uh, but what uh, uh, we will talk more about are neural networks. So there are various forms of neural networks. The most simplest form is the feed-forward neural network. Uh, then uh, there are other type of networks we are going to talk about, uh, convolutional neural networks, or there are more complex networks uh, in which the information goes back and forth between the neurons. These are called, for example, recurrent uh, neural networks. So uh, this should give you a bit the, the, the idea of uh, how the field is categorized. Actually, the distinction, the boundaries between what is supervised, what is unsupervised, what is reinforcement learning are not so strict. Okay? But this is just to give you uh, uh, um, an idea. And uh, essentially, in supervised learning, as I was saying, you have a set of data with associated labels. What distinguishes it uh, uh, from unsupervised learning is that in supervised learning, you just have the data. Okay? You don't have the labels. And I'm going to talk about that now. Uh, and uh, in uh, uh, reinforcement learning, is a, a bit different. Uh, you, you, you have some information uh, coming to, let's say, the agent, but not in the form of data. Uh, and we will talk about that even uh, uh, later on. Uh, oh, yes. Ah, the deep learning uh, is nothing else than uh, uh, feed forward the neural networks in which uh, uh, the number of hidden layers is relatively large. Uh, I will explain it better later on. It's supervised learning, it's feed forward neural networks let's say, uh, or whatever, wh whenever you add the word, the, the adjective deep in front of uh, any of the neural networks means that there are more neurons. <laughs> uh, so, uh, other questions? Okay, so let's uh, continue with the uh, unsupervised uh, learning. So as I was saying, uh, this, uh, uh, this category of machine learning tools are characterized by the fact that uh, uh, there are no labels in your data, ju ju just data. Uh, and uh, the goal uh, is to f essentially find informative patterns in your data. Okay. By this, I mean things like uh, uh, the example over there. Okay. So 
you might be given images of uh, the type on, on the left hand side there, so apple, dogs, uh, uh, bats, whatever. Uh, and you might hope that giving just those images uh, uh, um, to your uh, machine learning algorithm, uh, it will end up in somehow dividing them in clusters. Okay? Of course, there are no correct clusters here. Okay? So the, uh, the, the point is very, is very tricky. Uh, but you might think that, OK, in all the pictures uh, in which there are animals, there are uh, two spots uh, that are not too far apart, one from the other, okay? the eyes. Okay? So at some point, you might think that the algorithm might detect the fact that there are eyes in certain images, and there are no eyes in other images, and then divide this, uh, these two uh, sets uh, uh, one from, uh, from the other. Yeah. Uh, and it's useful to have this type of classifications then because, uh, uh, because uh, uh, when then you have uh, a, new, um, a new image, uh, like, uh, like for example this one, uh, the algorithm might recognize it immediately uh, without, uh, uh, as an animal, uh, without needing to test whether it is an animal or not. So without needing to test whether it breeds, uh, it breeds or not, for example, or if uh, you have to feed it, etc. And this, of course, can be useful. Uh, you can imagine in whatever application you like, but for example, uh, in medicine. Mm -hmm. um, so there are various, uh, various methods here, so let me list, uh, since I've list uh, uh, just now, this one su for supervised learning. Let me list some of them here. Uh, one that we're going to see, in, uh, to see in details is principal component analysis. Abbreviated as PCA. Uh, but then, there are uh, others of which uh, uh, are uh, pretty, pretty common. Uh, one that is, uh, uh, mm, if you want it, you can think about it as being inspired from statistical physics. So these are called restricted Boltzmann machines. RBM. Uh, there are also here uh, the use, uh, you can use also for uh, uh, unsupervised learning neural networks, okay? Um, and uh, in particular, what are called generative adversarial networks. So you can already see that uh, the boundaries between these sets uh, become quite blurry because I'm using neural networks uh, to do something in unsupervised learning. You can use neural networks essentially in everything of this. Okay? Uh, the autoencoders uh, that finds uh OK, no. I, uh if I'm going to explain um, some, some of the details of this, it's going to be too long, so let, let me skip it. And let, let, let me go directly to the one that I wanted to explain, which is principal component analysis, OK? Uh, one thing that uh, we can use uh, for, uh, um, one thing for, for which you can we can use unsupervised learning uh, is uh, for what is called dimensionality reduction. What is dimensionality reduction? Is that uh, essentially reducing uh, the, uh, so your data comes with, uh, uh, come with very large vectors in general, but not all of uh, uh, the information that you need um, so not all uh, the components of your vectors uh, encode uh, interesting information for you, maybe. Uh, 
So you might want to reduce, essentially, the dimension of your vector. You want to find uh, the important degrees of freedom there, if you want to use uh, a more physical uh, language. And there are various ways of doing it. For example, autoencoders can do that. But we're going to see uh, how we do dimensionality reduction with PCA. <coughs> uh, okay, principal component analysis uh, uh, is something that, okay, said like that uh, uh, might sound, uh, at least to me at the beginning, uh, sounded with, with a physicist formation, sounded something uh, quite strange. Uh, in, in the end, is uh, diagonalizing a matrix and uh, truncate it, okay, for the, for the eigenvalues with, uh, with small values. That, that's all what it is. Uh, so, so I can explain it uh, pretty, uh, pretty easily here. So we have, uh, uh, as usual, our set of data in the form of vectors, x, uh, xi, uh, and uh, each of these uh, i, uh, so sorry, uh, each of the components uh, of my vector might be uh, P real components, uh, this P can be called features, are usually called features. Uh, so th those are features of your vectors. Yeah? So you can imagine uh, um, some data about me. Uh, one feature can be uh, how tall I am, uh, one other feature my weight, etc., etc. And uh, you can have many people, not just me. And this index i is just uh, uh, denotes the, the, the various people. Yeah? Uh, and you can store all this data in a, in a large matrix. Uh, let's call it z, whose columns are given by my vectors uh, uh, x1, let's say, x2, etc. And I have n of them. So the column represents the, the single samples, uh, so the single individuals like me, uh, and the rows uh, uh, represent single features. So in the first uh, row, you have uh, the height in centimeters of all the people uh, in my example. Yeah. In the second row, you have the weight, etc. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the Mm, the main goal of PCA is that it returns the most informative basis, in a sense. What do we mean by basis here? Well, this is a matrix, okay? So a basis is associated to it. And this is called uh, the, the one that is given to you directly uh, by your data is called naive basis. Okay. Uh, and the most informative basis will be given by a combination so in the easiest case, a linear combinations of uh, uh, the most informative features here. Yeah. Uh, so how does it work? Uh, uh, well, let's see first uh, maybe an example. How bad is it? Uh, this is a nice example because it's very much related to Northern Ireland. Uh, so you can see he that here there are, let's say, four individuals, okay? the, the four nations of the UK. So one nation is England, one is Wales, Scotland, and the other one is Northern Ireland. Uh, and you have the average uh, food consumption uh, on average per person per week in each of these uh, four, uh, four nations, divided uh, in various categories of food. Okay? So first alcoholic drink, then beverages, etc. cetera. Uh, and, uh, Okay, you see this data and you have to start wondering, okay, what's the difference between uh, here and there? What's the difference between Northern Ireland and England or whatever? So uh, in this case, it might not be too difficult, let's say, to spot that, for example, uh, 
um, in Northern Ireland, uh, uh, the consumption of fresh fruit is pretty, uh, pre is pretty tiny compared to uh, the consumption of, of fresh fruit in England, in Scotland, and in Wales. And you can see that, of course, the other way around is when you talk about uh, potatoes, okay? because Ireland is famous about, uh, for potatoes. So, in fact, uh, there is a high consumption of potatoes in Northern Ireland, higher, uh, sensibly higher than the rest. Okay? So for this type uh, of uh, very few data, it might be extremely easy uh, to, let's say, find uh, uh, important features. Um, and uh, um, in general, that, that is surely not the case. Uh, so if you use PCA, uh, which I'm going to describe in a second, uh, for this set of, uh, uh, of data, you will find a principal component okay, that is composed uh, essentially of uh, potatoes, fruit, cheese, and alcohol uh, in different weights, okay? such that it's a linear combination of these four components, essentially, with different weights. And this is now going to be one single axis. And if you plot uh, the four nations uh, on this axis, you can immediately see that the cluster appears. Okay? So Wales, England, and Scotland are clustered together, whereas Northern Ireland is far apart. So this is the axis, the basis, on which the largest variance can be found in this, uh, in this set. Yeah. Uh, so the largest variance, in, in which sense? In a specific sense. So let's, uh, uh, let's give, uh, to immediately understand this, let's give, uh, uh, a, again, a silly uh, but physical example. Uh, in which you have uh, uh, a spring moving and you have a camera taking, uh, uh, taking snapshot uh, of the spring moving. Now, uh, the camera is not positioned perfectly uh, perpendicular in a perpendicular position with respect to the spring. So if you plot it in this naive basis given by the camera, uh, the, 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 the various points in which, uh, in which the ball is, you will find something like this which, of course, we are physicists. We recognize that uh, this is a one-dimensional motion, so there must be just one important degrees of freedom, one important feature. Yeah? Uh, and uh, it's simply the one uh, uh, that you might have uh, if you rotate your camera. Uh, well, performing principal component analysis uh, uh, for this type uh, of easy problem means actually to do a rotation. And this is the rotation. Those are exactly the same, uh, the same uh, uh, points, uh, but rotated. And we say that this uh, horizontal one is our principal component. And you can see that there is a large variance on the data on this uh, principal component, much, much larger than the variance that you have in, in the second component. Uh, OK, let's stop here, and let's explain uh, the the mathematics behind it, uh, and uh, you will do a, uh, a tutorial exercise uh, on, on this, so on the computer with some, with some real data uh, actually coming from uh, photonics. And uh, uh, so here we have our, uh, yes, our matrix here. So essentially we want to uh, remove redundancy from, uh, from this matrix. Uh, and uh, so one first point is that the, the data have to be centered, okay? So they have to be centered uh, um, uh, to their mean, okay? So first, center the data uh, for each feature such that the mean uh, of each feature is zero. Uh, and then, once you do that, you can construct uh, uh, immediately uh, a mean-free correlation uh, matrix uh, uh, related to, uh, to, to matrix Z. Okay? So we can construct a correlation matrix. Let's say we divide by the number of, uh, of data that were given. Uh, okay. 
And if you do, in <coughs> if you construct this matrix, you can immediately convince yourself that the ijth element is the average of the feature i uh, times the feature j, so just a correlation between the features. <coughs> so if you want to find the most relevant, the combination of most relevant features, what you do is that you diagonalize this matrix. So when you diagonalize it, you might plot um, the various uh, uh, values of uh, your eigenvectors. And you may see that some of them are, let's say, particularly large. And then others are relatively smaller. And if you're lucky enough, you find a significant gap. When you find that, you can say, OK, this, in this case, four uh, uh, eigen, uh, uh, eigenvalues um, are the ones that will correspond to what we can call uh, the most relevant eigenvectors. And uh, in this uh, field, uh, these most relevant eigenvectors are called principal components. Now, obviously, those are given uh, by a linear combination uh, and uh, uh, of the original features. Uh, and for some problems, uh, uh, linear combinations is not enough. So there are variations uh, of, this, uh, uh, of this algorithm. It's called uh, uh, this variation for nonlinear features. It's called uh, uh, kernel PCA, in which you use a nonlinear kernel. Uh, to perform something very similar. Um, question, was I, yeah? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so the question is that, okay, my, my data can have different units, can have uh, very different, uh, you have to take that into account, okay? So you, uh, I would say that uh, uh, one can uh, normalize this data, okay, apart from centering them, uh, you can use their own variance within each feature. Yeah, you can use that, but I think that, one really needs to put uh, the hand on, on, on the problem. And maybe also have some initial intuition of what can actually be the, the most important. Because if you normalize everything with the variance, then, then you, you screw a lot. <laughs> yeah. So you might think from the very beginning, uh, OK, my, uh, I mean, the consumption of, uh, uh, New Zealand's fruit in uh, the whole UK is not going to be relevant in any case, even if maybe it's all consumed uh, in ways. Yeah, you, you, it needs some uh, subjective uh, initial filtering and interpretation of it. Uh, other questions? I'm going to give you, a, again, a couple of uh, examples from, uh, um, from quantum information, uh, similar to the ones that I gave you before. Uh, so for example, here, uh, we have performed, uh, uh, it's, it's another silly example. We, we, you, you can take a Werner state, same as before, 
uh, of course, there is only one parameter. But if you rotate it, like, uh, like I did here, by this, uh, this single parameter is not immediately there from the, from the data. You diagonalize your matrix, and you see that in this case there is a perfect uh, gap of, uh, uh, of scale one, uh, of length one. Uh, from the first uh, uh, eigenvalue uh, to, to the other significant eigenvalues. And uh, if you uh, add a bit of noise to this, uh, to this um, data, so alpha, uh, um, so, sorry, you add some white noise to, this, uh, uh, to, to all the components of this matrix, then this is not going to be exact. And these are going to be slightly blurred. And once you plot uh, um, your matrix on the first and second principal components, so the first uh, two eigenvectors uh, corresponding to two eigenvalues of largest value, you still can see uh, a high variance of one of, uh, uh, on the first principal component and a much smaller variance on the second principal component. Uh, please note the scale. No, the, the scale of the, in the horizontal axis is much larger than the scale in the vertical axis. And uh, here I just uh, uh, plot, so these two different colors uh, are not obtained with PCA, but it's just to give you uh, um, an idea that once you have found uh, a certain, uh, you, once you have found your principal components, then you can further analyze your data. So for example, you can distinguish in this case whether the state is entangled or not. And it's going to be much easier than to use, for example, other uh, supervised uh, learning uh, method uh, to distinguish separable and entangled state if you have found just one or two uh, degrees of freedom that are relevant rather than the full matrix. And this is shown in this, uh, in this picture. A, a more complex example, again, a slightly more complex, is when we use two qubits. Uh, so if I take again uh, uh, the x states, you can see that, uh, as I said before, the x states uh, have <coughs> three uh, degrees of freedoms. And if you plot uh, uh, the x states in, in in the axis determined by these three degrees of freedom, uh, you, you plot, for example, here is the, uh, is the, is the expectation value of uh, sigma x times sigma x. Uh, here you have y, and the vertical you have z. Uh, they, uh, you can see that these x states, uh, they lie uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this tetrahedron. And uh, here I distinguished the inner part uh, in which the states are, uh, are separable uh, and the outside part in which they are entangled. So just to, uh, just to say that there is a certain structure here. We know that there is a certain structure once uh, uh, you have uh, uh, identified the, the three, uh, uh, these three axes. But if you rotate these qubits, these structures is again blurred and you cannot see it. Uh, However, if you first do principal component analysis, uh, and you see this is an example, uh, again, of, uh, of these rotated x states uh, in which there is some noise added, uh, so these uh, three uh, eigen, uh, eigenvalues uh, are not exactly the same, uh, but still one can see a clear gap. And uh, uh, if one therefore rotates uh, accordingly or plots, let's say, the original data accordingly to this uh, uh, new basis, this principal component basis, uh, the structure that I was mentioning here, so this, uh, this geometric structure, reappear. Okay? Now here it's a bit difficult to see, but maybe, yes, I, I already. So here it's a bit easier, no? because you move it. And again, uh, I, I colored, uh, uh, in order to make it more clear uh, to, to your eyes, I colored in, uh, uh, in blue uh, the, the entangled states, and in this other color that I don't know what color is it, 
uh, the I'm slightly colorblind. <laughs> so uh, the, uh, the separable ones, okay? So at the beginning, these uh, X states, they have, uh, uh, I don't know, three plus uh, uh, four plus uh, four, so 11, uh, uh, 11 degrees of freedom. But once you find the, the, the three relevant ones, then you can use uh, them to, uh, to further analyze your data in a much easier way. Okay? So that is uh, a possible application of, uh, of principal component analysis. Um, and other examples uh, are uh, for, uh, in general, for quantum tomography. You will see Luca giving uh, uh, to you an example of this in the, in the tutorial. Uh, or, for example, entanglement detection uh, and uh, things like that. Uh, questions? Okay, uh, if not, I can uh, start with the uh, reinforcement learning. So this is the last uh, uh, of the three main categories, uh, the one that I was mentioning here. So you can think of reinforcement learning as uh, uh, a set of, uh, uh, of machine learning methods in which, for example, you want to teach to a robot how to walk in an unknown environment. Uh, so you cannot really use uh, the other methods okay, because the environment will be unknown. So you cannot train uh, the robot on uh, an environment for which you have a set of data, a set of labels like, okay, don't go there because there, is, uh, uh, there are stairs uh, or don't go there because there is a hole uh, and you will fall down. I'm not aware of that. Um, it, it might be exactly the same. Uh, I, I really don't know. Does anyone know? The, the, the f uh, uh, yeah, no, the, the question was uh, uh, if this is the same PCA used uh, in uh, social science. Thanks. Uh, okay, so, so I, I was saying that, okay, y y you can uh, uh, use supervised learning to teach your robot to walk here in this environment, but it will tell nothing to your robot uh, if you now put it uh, in, uh, in Adriatic or guest house, of course. So you cannot really use this, uh, these tools. Uh, so the generic, uh, the generic setting is, uh, is the following. So there is an environment that will be in a certain state. So let's indicate this state as S. Uh, and then there will be an agent, your robot, for example, that can, uh, or let's say the brain into your robot, better, better said, that. that can observe the environment. Oh, there, are, there will be some observation. Uh, and based on that observation can perform certain actions. Actions uh, to the environment means action, for example, to the robot itself, okay? So the, the, the robot itself is part of, uh, 
of the environment. This is the agent, is the machine learning algorithm that teach what to do uh, to whatever is inside the environment. Uh, and uh, uh, the agent usually gets information not just from the observations, but also from some rewards. Which can simply be, well, I, I managed to walk uh, around uh, an unknown uh, room without uh, falling down okay? for a, a certain amount of time, the largest amount of time possible. So this, uh, you, you, can put a, you can give a reward for every 10 seconds uh, that you, you stay up, your robots stay up. No? Um, and, uh, okay, the setting, uh, therefore, is very different with respect to the setting uh, of the other two cases. Because you start with no labels and no data. The environment itself can be dynamical. So in particular, your robot can move or uh, someone can move the objects in the room. Um, and the agent can observe the environment, can perform actions, and can get rewards. Uh, and the goal here is to learn the best sequence of actions that maximize uh, uh, the rewards. The, the rewards can be uh, very, very sparse. So, for example, the rewards can be just at the end of the, your actions. Okay? So the, the question that I was asked uh, before about how to treat situation in, in which you have a really small amount of information, the, this, can be a, this can be a setting. Um, so, what happened here? So this is a typical uh, example uh, of, uh, uh, of this setting. Okay? So the state here, uh, the state S of the environment, is given by the full map uh, of uh, the position of a player that wants to, this red thing, that wants to go around and uh, get um, uh, more treasures, these green, uh, green spots, uh, as possible. Okay? moving around and gets more treasure, uh, as more treasure as possible. Uh, so the action will be moving, uh, and the rewards uh, are these uh, treasures uh, collected. Okay. But you can imagine at self-driving cars, medical applications, etc. There are uh, various methods for reinforcement learning. Uh, some of the most used one are policy gradient. That I'm going to explain with some details. Uh, um, Q-learning. Q-learn. Or uh, there is an, also another one that I want to mention, projective simulations. And I'm mentioning it because uh, it was not invented by computer scientists. It was invented by Briegel, Hans Briegel, and collaborators, uh, who is a theoretical physicist working on uh, quantum optics, uh, etc., quantum information science. Uh, and it's 
they first developed it in the classical setting uh, because they wanted to apply it to the quantum setting. So, so there is already a quantum, uh, uh, a fully quantum variation of this. Yeah. But, uh, uh, okay, I, is this strict, uh, this, uh, because this would be a nice uh, moment uh, to, to, to stop. Uh, so, so yes, it's a nice moment to stop in any case. So questions? Okay, see you then uh, at half 30, yeah.